Welcome to the SAS meeting. Uh, today on the agenda, we will be talking about uh, immutable uh, objects and in particular, uh, array buffer and uh, also potentially after that, a super freeze, which is a, uh, uh, a non-transitive uh, version of freeze, but that has different freezing properties. Um, so on the immutable array buffer, this is something that came up uh, recently on our side. Um, we have a need to be able to share uh, what we call copy bytes uh, across the wire. Uh, however, all the representation of bytes currently in JavaScript, uh, I mean, the representation of bytes are in array buffer, which are all mutable and actually cannot be frozen. Um, so we need a way to have an object, uh, whether it is array buffer related or not, that represents uh, frozen uh, immutable bytes. Uh, and that can be the representation of those. So when you receive those copy bytes, we can create that, uh, that object, or uh, we can also recognize those objects and know that if we uh, pass it around, it will not mutate under the, the hood anymore. Um, there is a proposal from uh, Jack Works uh, on limited uh, array buffer, which I believe is uh, about being able. I actually don't want to misrepresent. I, I I'm not. I, I haven't uh, gone back to the proposal recently, um, but it. I believe it's around uh, create like transitioning an array buffer into a uh, a frozen state. Is that right, Zach? Uh, yes, there is also another uh, another target for this proposal, which is give the give the slice of a uh, current array buffer to others. It might be mutable or immutable. This this is also useful. Yeah. Um, so as precedents for, uh, things that exist currently, uh, in the ecosystem, there is the web, uh, blob API, which basically, uh, is a representation of, of bytes that you cannot mutate because you can, you have to access you have to request a uh, an array buffer, which ends up giving you a copy, uh, a mutable copy uh, of of the bytes. Um, so that that would be an approach. Uh, that that that's a precedent in the in the in the platform or in the ecosystem. Um, this topic also somewhat tangentially relates to something that I've been uh, advocating for in plenary and outside of it, uh, which is for. Currently, the array buffer API doesn't preclude uh, copy on write optimization, but no engines actually uh, do them. Uh, and if you think about it, ha um, being able to create a ar limited array buffer view uh, that cannot be mutated is, uh, is similar to copy on write optimization, where you create another uh, potentially array buffer that you're guaranteed cannot. Uh, cannot go and mutate the backing buffer. Um, so in general, I'm wondering what would be the best approach to have a representation of immutable bytes in the platform. So I want to express an opinion that that um, the copy on write technique is is you know, while val very valuable, I'd like to, you know, it'd be nice to, to see it happen. It doesn't subsume the need for an immutable array buffer because right. the copy and write technique still doesn't give you a pointer that, I mean, an object reference that can be shared that, uh, that uh, only gives access to a fixed set of bytes. Correct. But in my opinion, it is relevant when you consider an approach like blob, um, where but, yeah, but blob, but blob only creates a fresh copy when you ask it for a buffer because of the absence of 
the possibility of a frozen buffer. Right. But the point is, if you have copy on write, blob can, when you create a blob from an array buffer, you create a copy from the array buffer. Blob will never mutate it. So internally, if it was a platform thing, like there could be optimization there. And then whenever someone wants a copy of the, the bytes, again, it's a copy on write of the internal uh, buffer that was captured by the blob. And I all the, if nothing is modified, could end up being uh, backed by the same uh, backing buffer. So the so that does make sense. That means the blob itself is the thing that you share if you want to share immutable access to a Correct. set of bytes. The thing that I find disturbing about it from an API point of view is just the multiplication of similar abstractions that you've got. You know, we we would um, we already have array buffer and U int eight arrays and data views. Um, I've never actually found myself wanting to use a data view. I'm not sure why we need it in addition to the others. And then on top of, of those three, we would additionally have blobs in order to just get the immutable one. Um, uh, I'd like to hear from uh, Peter in particular about um, what Modable's already done with regard to the ROMed form of, of these various abstractions, what, what they're... Uh, whether it's it conform whether it's beyond the current spec or not, what what the actual semantics are that's pr provided by XS when things are in ROM. Before, just quickly a quick answer. Um, I I would say like there are three different three distinct things. The views are later views on on the the array buffer. The array buffer carries the ability to go and mutate uh, uh, a, a that backing data. And then the blob is basically a way to pass around uh, an immutable uh, version of the device. Or uh, also the blob contains the main type of the bytes. Yes, correct. A blob, the web blob uh, has also other things like the main type, uh, which may not be relevant in, in our case. It was more of a concept of being able to carry uh, a, a container to uh, to pass around that, that represent immutable bytes. Okay, let me just uh, uh, check. When you said things like additional information like the MIME type, uh, is there anything else besides the bytes in the MIME type? Sorry, poorly phrased. It has additional things. One is additional information, like uh, so the MIME type. Uh, the other thing it has uh, that's not relevant is an ability to create web streams uh, to read uh, uh, oh. the backing data, which uh, obviously we wouldn't be able to bring in the, well, I mean, web streams are, have too much deep ties into the web platform to be able to be brought in the language. Okay. Um, okay. But it was more of a concept of a, an object to uh, pass around array buffers. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that that means that the, a blob without a blob a blobby thing without the mime type uh, would, on the web platform, not subsume the blob. So the blob, the web blob, would continue to exist. And um, so now you've got similar but different things for people on the web platform. Um, um, a platform blob could be a base class potentially for uh, a web blob. Well, that's ba base class versus subclass is still two different things. Yeah. Yeah. So Peter. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I mean, so what we've done um, in XS is, uh, I mean, I think pretty light compared to a lot of the things that uh, approaches that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. um, our goal with immutability has has always been um, not to introduce new things um, as much as possible. And so, uh, you know, we uh, there's sort of two questions. To this one is, what's the runtime behavior of immutable array buffers, and what's the how do you create them? I'll start with the runtime behavior because that's basically invisible. Um, you just have array buffers and they act 
exactly like uh, an immutable array buffer acts exactly like uh, a regular array buffer um, until you try to write to it, at which point it, of course, throws an exception. Uh, that's it. Uh, the, there's nothing new really for a developer to learn um, when they're using. And, and, the, the, and how does one create an immutable array buffer? That's the uh, that's the part that is slightly magical. Um, usual way in our environment that people create an immutable array buffer is they create a mutable a regular array buffer prior to what in um, SES or hardened JavaScript is called lockdown. And um, when that um, that that when the build it's the lockdown phase that uh, any array buffers that were created up to that point become immutable array buffers because they are moved to ROM for storage. Uh, and so that is, that's magic at the engine level um, that makes them immutable. Um, there is a time facility to make uh, an array buffer immutable um, and that is the petrify function. Um, okay. Petrify, is a general purpose way to make things um, extremely immutable. Um, and so we just apply that to array buffers. Um, the, 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 there is a, so I, I know you use the term petrify. Um, uh, Daniel Ehrenberg has a proposal, has a written down proposal on petrify and Matthew used the term petrify. I don't know if we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, my usage of the term because I was, uh, trying to correspond to what uh, Peter was doing and Good. It not be conceived as taking away his ability to use the term. Uh, just ignore my thing, it was just one document. Okay. Okay, so so Peter, uh, let, talk. T tell us about uh, what you have in mind in general for the semantics of Petrify. What Petrify does is it really behaves as if you had moved the entire object to ROM. So that means everything about uh, about the uh, the instance, the the public fields, the private fields, private methods, um, any buffers, any internal slots, all of them um, become immutable. Um, we understand this is um, not a behavior which is desirable in general. It is, um, and that's fine. Um, so, you know, we see our Petrify as a tool that could then be used to help build um, other APIs, such as um, the, the, you know, make an immutable slice, for example, that uh, Jack Works was uh, talking about. But I think we're, uh, you know, we, we really, I think for us, the important thing is that immutable buffers are just regular buffers that, you um, you know, fail when you try to write and nothing more. The semantics of how they're created, we're, uh, I think we're flexible on. Um, we, you know, we've done something that works really nicely for our environments, but we understand that it uh, it may be too powerful um, to have as a feature in the language. Is Petrify one level or transitive? Transitive. I'm sorry? It really goes for it. It, it's it's transitive because otherwise, I mean, it it could like if you had called it on a typed array, for example, it wouldn't get to the array buffer. Okay, uh, I mean, again, semantics are we're, we're happy to happy to explore different ways of, of doing that, but uh, but it solves real problems uh, for our environment. Okay, so um, the um, so uh, Matthew, when you talk about super freeze, would super freeze be the uh, the shallow step, you know, the the one level step that Petrify then repeats transitively? So when I talked about super freeze before, uh, I think it was more in 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 my mind it was more of a freeze, a, a cached freeze. Uh, so a, a freeze where you wouldn't keep asking the question about whether the target object is, uh, is frozen or not. Uh, and it didn't have different semantics on what can be frozen or 
uh, yeah, it, it didn't have a different semantics on what can be frozen on how far things are frozen. Okay, so uh, so one of the things that we have talked about in these meetings that that um, is having something like freeze, you know, uh, that also um, uh, as it froze the properties, froze them in such a, you know, basically if a, an object that was super frozen, let's say, or um, if if the would be one in which you can. Uh, objects that inherit from a super frozen object, you can override the properties with assignment without running into the override mistake. Right. Well, uh, that would be one of the nice things to bundle. There's the main thing that Peter was talking about, which is um, uh, having internal properties and, and um, you know, other non-named non property state uh, get frozen. I have some questions about that, but for-, yeah. for I feel like new um, freezing internal states and internal slots is a different uh, question than than what I was thinking about for super freeze. Uh, and as I've expressed before, I believe that should be based on a uh, protocol instead of uh, instead of the current of, of what freeze does, which is basically very in intrusive uh, and and mutates an object uh, without the object's consent. Okay, so I certainly agree that it needs the object's consent um, uh, in the sense that, that one should be able to create a class uh, of instances that um, uh, where the private fields cannot be, um, you know, cannot be locked down by a client because that can threaten the integrity of the, the purpose of the instances, it can be an attack. Um, uh, the other, the other one is all of the cases. Uh, you, uh, 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 Peter, maybe uh, if you could explain the um, uh, the impurities query on XS, because uh, I think that is strongly um, very informative with regard to the rest of this conversation. I'm thinking in particular about the inability to. Um, petrify or super freeze or whatever, a closure that captures assignable variables? Um, sure, I mean, so uh, I think um, that call is currently called immutabilities, uh, or immutabilities, sorry. That's, that's the name that it's actually currently available under. And it's sort of like, I mean, it, it walks the same path through the object um, transitively as petrify. And it's basically looking for all the things that Petrify would um, would need to, to make it readable. So it returns a, a list of all of the things that are not uh, in that in that path. And so it's a um, it's really just a diagnostic tool. It doesn't do anything. It just tells you whether this object is uh, has any. Um, Mutable state in it or not, and so um, if it doesn't, it conforms to uh, the definition um, of pure that um, that Mark that you've described before. Okay, and and so so when you so with regard to petrify, if you pre petrify an object that 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 inherently contains state that can't be ROMed, like a closure that captures assignable variables. Uh, what does petrify? What does petrify do in that case? I think it actually makes that. Um, there's two options actually. Um, again, depends on on how everything's set up. Um, the default behave like if you were to do it at runtime, right? If you could just call petrify, that um, that closure would actually become immutable. So those would not be assignable variables. Um, if um, if, however, the, um, the petrify was applied by the linker as part of moving something to ROM, it could notice that those um, variables are writable and uh, creating an the alias table that would allow access to uh, them writable um, if necessary, uh, if they're written to basically copy and write. Um, yeah. So it's okay. a, but uh, but 
Okay, so that that is certainly a petrify that's too powerful to be a generally available language primitive. Uh, I think with regard to this issue about uh, you know classes um, uh, could be attacked. I think changing the semantics of the I mean closure is part of the sort of the you know, most important um, thing about closure is its encapsulation semantics, and from the outside of a closure to cause. The, its internal variables to become unassignable is, is pretty violent. Um, so I would, I would just consider closures to have implicitly always opted out, have no option to opt in, and that uh, classes probably would need an opt in to be petrified and otherwise are implicitly opted out. That, that, that makes sense. So, um, so for my idea here, like Petrify is relevant here for array buffer because array buffer is one case where you need to um, freeze or petrify the internal state. Um, however, I, as I mentioned, like I, I'm wondering if there if the better approach here is a uh, is a protocol based, uh, it's a protocol based approach for petrification or, or whatever the name would be, where instances of objects that are willing to be uh, put in the immutable uh, state have this symbol on it that can be invoked and once it is invoked, the, uh, the, okay, the object will, will perform the step to mute, to freeze its own state. Now, the, the question is, how do you verify that indeed the uh, the, the object is is in fact uh, immutable, deeply immutable? Yeah, that's 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 why I'm thinking about the the protocol being an opt in or opt out rather than a method that actually does something. Uh, because then if, you're op if you've opted in or have not, have not opted out, whichever way we go, uh, and you get um, uh, petrified, then it's still the machine that does the petrification. It's just the object that, that, that enabled it to proceed. What if, um, what if the state of the object is kept in the side table and not just a private field or a member of the class? Ah, great question. What Which, by the way, is and it's also a central question with regard to the semantics of where is the mutability in a class, a derived class where the base might be doing a return override. Uh, uh, if the derived class has private fields, as we know, it's not a consistent theory to ascribe the immutability to the instances because the instances that are return overridden might already be, um, be immutable. Um, uh, and, and Peter, I'm wondering about also about XS, what its stance there is with regard to the uh, impurities queries. If you've got a class with, um, a derived class with private fields, uh, and you petrify the class, um, what happens? So there's private fields in the in the, the prototype class, like in a class that it's derived from. Is that what you're asking, Mark? Uh, what I'm saying the the if the I suppose it, I suppose this is more relevant for the one level. Uh, case. Um, uh, if you, no, it's, it's relevant, no, sorry, that's not true. It's relevant if, even for the transitive case. If you petrify a derived class, it's still the case that the base class, even if petrified, might be a, might have a constructor that returns just the object constructor, the, you know, the object prototype object or something that is you know really really needs to be immutable, um, and 
Therefore, when the derived class seems to be adding fields to the um, return override object, you cannot account for that mutability. There's no, as mutability that's on the instance. So you so the only thing left is to account for the mutability as the hidden weak map inside the class, which is how the semantics is described anyway. But that means that a class, uh, a derived class with private fields uh, cannot be considered pure. Unless you verify that, unless unless something somehow verifies that the entire chain, inheritance chain above it, never engages in return override, which would be a little bit magical. But is that? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm it may be just me getting confused, but we're we're sort of mixing the fact that a class petrified with petrified. I'm not sure I can tease that apart. Sorry if I'm okay. So, so if it wasn't for return override, a consistent theory of where the mutability is of private fields would be that the mutability is on the instances. And that means that a petrified class, which is which which would which the 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 impurities query could verify was transitively mutable, could still have mutable instances. Uh, whose private fields could be mutated. Uh, the the, the uh, problem with that theory is that if the class that declares those fields is a derived class and the base class that it inherits from might be returning an object that's already immutable, the semantics demands that the uh, the, so to speak, addition of private fields to the returned object still work, um, uh, but, the only, but the way the semantics describes that, and I, I would say that the only consistent way the semantics can describe it is to ascribe the mutable state to a hidden weak map in the class rather than to mutable state in the instance. Because in this case, there's mutability that's per instance, but the instances themselves have been verified not to be mutable. I, 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 I think I, I disagree here. Like if, if you have a constructor that returns an immutable instance, you just simply cannot create a derived class of, uh, of that. Uh, I mean, the language does create derived classes of that right now. Yeah, but at runtime, you wouldn't be able to create instances of it. But if you can create a class, it just won't be functional. It's it's the same it's, it's the same kind of uh, issue if you if you have a constructor that returns a frozen object today and then uh, uh, and then the derived class tries to uh, to add properties. No, no. If the derived class tries to add um, private fields to a frozen object returned yeah, by I, the superclass, it works was, right now. Yeah, but I, I was talking about if a derived class tried to add properties to uh, a frozen super, it won't work. No, I understand it, that. I'm, talk, I'm sp talking specifically about private fields. But, uh, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is that private field is the equivalent of, like private fields and petrified is the equivalent of uh, frozen and adding public fields. Okay, okay. So okay, good, good. Won't so work. um, so what so what we're saying is that in a hypothetical in a in a in a hardened in a in a JavaScript with Petrify, the way we would define hardened JavaScript is we would be very specific that that all of the primordials are not just transitively frozen and immutable by, by virtue of the absence of private fields, which they, I mean, of, pri of, of internal slots, which they have right now. Uh, we've been very careful about that with regard to, the, to, to all of the safe primordials. 
uh, that it's not, but that in addition, we would, we would be specifying that all of the shared, all of the shared safe primordials are petrified and therefore uh, cannot be enhanced by a return override and subclassing. Is that correct? No, I don't understand. Like, how is, and that, that goes back to Peter's question how is petrifying a class? Petrifying a class doesn't create petrified uh, instances. No, no, I understand that. That's the point. The, um, the, if, <clears throat> If, if you have a superclass that returns the object constructor and the object constructor is simply transitively frozen or just frozen, is simply frozen and known to not have any internal slots, then the existing language semantics uh, still demands that the um, that the subclass, uh, so to speak, add pro be able to successfully add private fields to it, and that's the thing that you want to prohibit uh, for the primordials in a future hardened JavaScript, uh, because um, uh, in a future hardened JavaScript, what you're what I think you're saying is we would like to ascribe the mutability of the private fields to the instance and a consistent theory for doing that would be that if we consider all of the um the objects that that we really want to be immutable, even if they have no internal slots, if we really want to, them to be considered immutable, we've got to petrify them or super freeze them or something. Uh, the freezing, freezing them, which is what we're doing now, combined with knowledge of no internal slots is not adequate to consider them to not be mutable. And then if you super freeze them such that they really are immutable and then uh, a subclass tries to extend their instance their their so to speak instance state with with new private fields enhance them with private fields that that would fail uh, and and it's only if that fails that you have a theory that can ascribe what would have been the mutability to the instance rather than the class I'm not sure I follow because I still don't believe that any of the intrinsics constructors should create uh, petrified instances. I don't see why it should. I'm not talking. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I'm talking about the object constructor itself, just as an example of an object that hardened JavaScript needs to be immutable. Yeah. So about. About this topic in general, about disallowing private fields on certain objects, I'm personally fine with this direction. I do want to remind this group that it was requests from, from here that made it so that we did say that frozen yeah. objects, all these things could allow, would allow private fields. It was yes. from this group that we got the requirement that, to have the weak map analogy. So, uh, Maybe we should also think about how, when uh, analyzing proposals, we could figure out these issues uh, ahead of time because you were already thinking a lot about hardened primordials and such, and maybe that maybe that would have flown into the design of of private fields. I, I think I, I think we just missed it uh, at that point. We didn't we didn't think about that problem. Uh, I mean, I wasn't around, so I definitely didn't think of it. Um, so so, so I, I was around, and it's probably my fault. And I th I think I saw is Justin still here? Justin Ridgewell. I think he was here earlier. I don't see him now. Yeah, on the call. Um, I think Justin actually argued for something much like what I'm arguing for now, 
and I didn't see the implications at the time and counter argued for the, um, uh, the pure weak map analogy. So, well, Justin, Justin argued a lot of things, but uh, yeah, the, the surprise at the weak map analogy extending in these sorts of directions was sort of widely held among the committee. And uh, I was defending the weak map analogy because it, uh, it, it, it made sense and it was what Mark was advocating for and that's what we went with. But um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, there was, there was definitely some skepticism. I, I guess the question that I was trying to ask is, if we don't take the weak map analogy as an analogy, if we say, yes, we have some side weak map in which we're putting objects in properties, how do we ensure that Petrify actually makes sure that, that those properties are frozen? I, I don't think it can. So in, in the case of- Which is, a... which is that's why, that's what uh, Matthew's protocol proposal was about, that a given object could kind of keep track of all its bookkeeping everywhere. So there, there's, so the, uh, I mean, for a, a genuine external weak map that the object doesn't know about, the protocol proposal doesn't enable the object to do anything about weak maps that it's a key end that it doesn't know about. And I think that's a feature, not a bug. Uh, with regard to classes, in the hidden weak map theory of class private fields, uh, because the weak map is reachable from the class, um, the, a, a transit of Petrify, uh, if allowed to succeed um, uh, by whatever, you know, whatever opt-in or opt-out, if, if, if you transitively Petrify a class, then the, by the weak map theory, that would necessarily lock down the weak map, which by the way has, a, has an even worse problem, which is if you, lock, if you really lock down the weak map, then you can't even create new instances of the class. And that's, right, that's the problem. You, you can't freeze the whole weak map at, 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 or petrify the whole weak map. At best, what you can do is uh, freeze the value associated to, uh, to your entry in, in the weak map and make sure that you're not allowed to replace the value uh, at any time. So it can only be deleted, but not reset basically. And and that that's just weird semantics uh, for for a weak map like like that. Yeah, I uh, I think we're all agreed that this is weird. The question is, how do we get out of the dilemma? I, I'm saying that the array buffer analogy is an interesting one too, because who's saying that the individual bytes are actually properties of the array buffer that are reachable by any way? Are they actually built into the weak map? That we're talking about, and then so they so they have to be reachable by the array buffer if the array buffer has intrinsic behavior that is dependent on them, right? I mean, the thing about an object that happens to be a key in a weak map that it that it doesn't know about it that object can't have any methods that depend on the contents of that weak map. Because then it would, because it could only do that if it knew about the weak map, if the weak map was somehow transitively reachable from it. Yeah, and this is where Matthew's pointing out of, of the semantics of that internal weak map are weird. And to get Peter's behavior of how do you actually petrify an array buffer, you have to do something similar with its properties. You can't just say, okay, these bytes are now frozen, because if you fro freeze bytes, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're actually changing the property of the, the array that contains the bytes, right? Yeah, which is why, in, in in my opinion, you can only ask for the instance to petrify itself, and then you need a predicate to verify if that instance is actually petrified. Um, and and then it. And then you're back at the problem of what happens to petrified instance. I guess you cannot use them anymore as uh, new weak map keys uh, because that would in effect associate state to them. 
like new private fields, you mean? I guess that's not a problem if all of the code path from the instance itself. So I guess that is the difference. Yeah, maybe not. I, I take that back. Uh, petrification, you can always associate state to, to an object as long as the object itself and uh and the, so now now it, it becomes a question of like the 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 functions that are part that are reachable from the objects uh whatever they can access in their scope whether those things are uh petrified or like do not allow associating anything with the instance that that's just i'm having a hard time wrapping my head around like what it means to be for for an object to be petrified. So I mean that's that's the beautiful thing about the the transitive notion of of petrified or or purity is that um uh and a a a, a let's say a no argument method of the object or uh, that depend that depends on state means that the state has to be reachable from the object and that means that if the object is transitively pure that the methods of the object only have access, only have you know uh, direct, have only have have only captured access to um, to pure state, and therefore can't bring about mutable behavior. But but that also says that like any other functions that are closed over by those methods cannot in any way have a path. Uh, to look up state associated to that object. Yeah, that's that's transitive, right? And that's that's why um, the um, you know the purity probably stops. I mean, that, well, necessarily stops at if it reaches closures that capture assignable variables, or closures that contain a weak map where the uh, where the weak map itself okay, is not, uh, where or the weak map itself is not frozen, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if the, if if a closure that captures a a const variable where the value of the variable is not petrified, then the closure is not petrified. Okay, so it's not a. So, so that, that also, uh, we're actually uh, getting at time, but um, that also means that would two different implementations of this have the same notion of whether an object is verified or not? Like, are, are they guaranteed to be able to make the same kind of uh, transitive checks? Like, like some implementations, for example, when you have a closure, yeah. not capture the whole, um, all, all of the context, only capture a subset of the context that, it, that is reachable. Uh, what if that subset is, uh, is petrified, but the bigger subset isn't? And then yeah. some, uh, some engines wouldn't be able to uh, consider it as uh, petrified where another would. And what does direct value? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think there's. I mean, there's two. There's two problems there. One is a closure whose implementation captures more state than the uh, semantic model of closures would have it capture, and the other one is a closure that captures less state than the semantic model would imply. The first case I think is easy, which is you can it's you know you can just consider the subset of um, what the implementation is retaining that corresponds to the to the ver to the variables named freely in the closure. You don't have to cap. You don't have to look at the entire record. Uh, the other problem, though, which is a compiler decides that a variable is dead or whatever and drops it. Uh, even though it's a variable that's used freely in the closure and therefore implied to be captured, um, I, I do agree that that's um, a you know, that's that's going to be a a possibly show-stopping problem, certainly a hard problem 
at trying to get engines to agree on a common deterministic semantics there. Um, all right, we're, we're at time. Uh, thanks everyone for the discussion. Bye.